Last week we read, as God will judge those who oppose him after the millennium takes place, after that thousand years, and then the judgment will come. This week we're going to read of a new heaven and a new earth uh, that will happen at the conclusion of that thousand year millennial period. Can you imagine what earth 2.0 will look like? You know, one time someone tried to correct me and said, it's not going to be Earth 2.0 because Earth 2.0 is in the millennium and, and Jesus restores everything. No, that's still the Earth just being updated with the 0.5. So it's 1.5 that will happen you know, during that millennial period. 2.0 is a whole new Earth. It's, it's not the old being updated this is a new earth, and it's going to be something that we've never seen before. And I don't even think I can imagine what it's going to look like. Even reading through this, my mind tries to picture what this new earth will look like, and I can't even fathom it, because it's something that we've never even got a glimpse of. Even the most glorious city on earth is nothing compared to what the new Jerusalem and what earth is going to look like at that time. Today's message is titled, All Things New, as we continue our study through Revelation with chapter 21, and we pick it up in verse 1, where we read, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Chuck Smith was an avid surfer, and, um, and there's no more sea. What is he going to be thinking? That, what's he going to be doing in his spare time? You know, and and I, I think of these things as I'm like, no sea. Where am I going to go sit for the beautiful sunrises and sunsets? Where, you know, uh, uh, first of all, I don't even like the beach. But um, it's sandy. And it's just gets, I was in the Navy nine years. I, I don't need any more beach. So I moved to Arizona where the whole thing is beach. But here, this, we have to get, out of our minds comparing what the Bible is telling us about the new earth, the new heaven. We have to get out of our minds uh, comparing it to what's here now. Comparing life to what is here like life is like on earth now. Because it's not going to be anything like that. If it is, bummer. Because I don't want life to be like this. We have a very good life. We, we really enjoy you know, life. We enjoy good food, and sometimes it makes us sick. Um, even when it's supposed to be good, it may have even tasted good, but it makes you sick. That's not going to happen in heaven. There will be no bad food. Asparagus will taste like candy. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how that's possible, but it, it's probable. The idea new here doesn't um, mean God is redoing what was in the past. This is the term bara, which means new from nothing. I am creating something new from nothing. I'm not starting with this or starting with that. It's new, completely new. And so that's exciting. This is something that hasn't existed before, and it's going to be perfect uh, as 
God creates this. Uh, no more see is actually an interesting concept because when you consider the sea, especially as it's referred to in the Bible, many times the sea is the source of sin. You see, satanic creatures come out of the sea. Now, we've seen Jesus and angels standing on the sea, but they didn't come out of the sea. And so the sea quite often is representative of sin. And there will be no more sin. And so there's no need for the sea to um, be used as a source of sin. So maybe they'll be called something else. These watery embodiments where you can go surfing. I don't know. But I know that this image, this sinful image of the sea is going to be wiped out. There's another illustration of the fact that the earth isn't going to have sin in it. And it's going to be wiped out. It's like saying there'll be no leaven there. You know, uh, um, so we're all going to be eating unleavened bread for eternity. No, that's not actually going to happen. I don't, I, maybe we'll be eating manna. Wouldn't that be cool? You know, because manna was wonderful stuff provided by God. Verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. We can't fathom that. We just really cannot fathom that. Lori sits there with a the neck brace on after having surgery, you know. It, it's, we live in a constant state of pain almost, right? I mean, I got up this morning, I had a little bit of vertigo, you know, and um, I, I was just feeling a little off, and my back hurt a little bit, but I, I'm here. Um, you know, God has a way of getting me here on Sunday mornings. You know, I, I, could walk, I could wake up without my arm attached and the next thing you know, I'll be here and it'll be reattached, everything will be fine. Uh, but I am looking forward to when that's not even going to be an issue. That waking up isn't even going to be an issue. So here is this new Jerusalem. This is what the bride, the church, us, this is what we're looking forward to. Now, don't discount the fact that Jesus is going to be there and we're really looking forward to being with him. But why would he make this so beautiful for us? Because he wants to bless us. Because he wants us to have this glorious city that he's going to bring to us. Jerusalem is prepared by God. When Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, is this another example of that place that he went to prepare for us? And here it is coming down from heaven. It's going to be a holy city. Not because the buildings are holy, because the occupants are holy. We are the occupants of this city. We're the church. We're going to be there in this city. And we are what makes that city holy. That means there's not even going to be a spot 
a speck of corruption in that city. There won't be anything unholy in the city at all. The new Jerusalem will be as beautiful as a bride coming down the aisle. As the husband stands there, the groomsman waiting for his bride to come down the aisle. And, and she's just all adorned and beautiful. And, uh, you know, that's a magical moment, but that's not, nothing compared to what this city is coming down, you know, out of heaven on to this new earth that has been created. When Moses was leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, there was a tabernacle, just like the tabernacle mentioned here. That tabernacle was made out of linen and poles, you know, gold-plated stuff, but it's still just a tent. That's what was created. That's where God inhabited while the people were in the wilderness. He lived, he inhabited, that's where he met the people in, in this tabernacle. But God won't be hanging out in a tent in the New Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, there's not even going to be a temple there in the New Jerusalem. No need for it. The current Jerusalem is a cup of trembling there's all kinds of messed up stuff going on in Jerusalem right now. I think the only reason why Jerusalem hasn't been directly attacked is because there are so many Arabs living in Jerusalem. Uh, be, there are many, there are some even in the Knesset and their political um, organizations, they have Arabs there serving uh, right alongside the Jews. And uh, if I were running things, that's not how it would be. But they uh, decided that's how they were going to create their government and that's how they were going to operate. And uh, it, it's, a very, uh, it, it's a very unusual environment. And when I was there, I could see the good. I could also see the bad. It's right there in front of your face. And uh, it, you'd be shocked when you see the beautiful areas that the Jews have built up and, and uh, the gardens that are there, the farms and all of this. And then a lot of the Arab land, all you'll see is just dirt and, uh, and it's grimy. Their buildings are dilapidated. You know, there aren't plants outside their windows to make them. They don't care about stuff like that. And, uh, and so it's like the difference between going to the slums or going to the upscale area. And, and it's not that every area in Israel or in Jerusalem is upscale. It's just the fact that people there choose to live a different way. And, uh, and in the New Jerusalem... Everything's going to be beautiful. I, I just can't. Can you imagine not having to dust? We live in Arizona. You know, you, you, either you dust every hour or you have dust. You live with it, you know. Uh, but there's not going to be dust. Uh, there's not going to be rust. There's not going to be corruption. I don't know how they're going to get the pigeons to wear diapers, but, um, you know, because it's not going to be everywhere, you know. You know what I'm talking about here? Never mind. So it says God will wipe every tear. There's going to be no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. It's all gone. All of those things that we have become accustomed to here on earth. We've learned to live with these things here on earth. They're not even going to be a factor in the New Jerusalem. But it's not only the New Jerusalem we should be excited about. Verse 5 continues. 
Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. God, who is on the throne, says, Behold, I'm making all things new. I'm doing it. I'm going to make things perfect. He has the new heaven, the new earth. He has new bodies for each of us. And he says there's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, none of the things that we're um, used to. Um, Joel? Hey, Joel? Can I get... um, the overhead light raised, uh, lowered and raised up real quick. It's kind of flickering over here. I'm starting to go into convulsions. <laughs> Thank you. It's good now. So, you know, what I consider is what our bodies are going to be like. Our bodies are going to be perfect bodies. They're going to have perfect hearing, perfect smell, perfect vision. And do and you know what I'm counting on? There's not going to be anything that smells bad. You know, I, I don't think we're going to be making faces I- in heaven. Oh, what was that? You know, you've been eating the broccoli again? I, I thought that would go away. No, we're going to have perfect everything. And I, I, how many of us can fathom that? I mean, even the person that is in the best physical shape, you know, works out and eats great and so on and so forth, even with being in that perfect, as far as this world is concerned, physical condition, it's still not perfect. They, they still have issues with their bodies. And, and you know, so I, I just can't wait till we have none of that. He made a new life for us. No more sin, no more death. He made a new future. There are going to be no more alarm clocks because there's no more time. And I, I just think, wow, everyone's going to be late. (laughs) He completed everything he set out to do from the beginning to the end. He's the creator of all things, the Alpha and the Omega. And since he's the one that started it all, he's going to be the one to complete it all. It's all going to be done according to his works. And it isn't that we have to work to be part of his plan. He gives us all of this freely. He gives it to us. It's not like, okay, you worked really, really hard, so you're going to be living on Fifth Avenue. You know, you're going to have a, a, an apartment overlooking, you know, Central Park. You're going to have, you know, the, the penthouse because you worked really hard at it. Um, but you didn't do so much, so you'll be living in the basement. You know, it's not going to be like that. Uh, I, I know that there's going to be some level of reward. That's why we're told to store up treasure in heaven, not here on earth. Because there's going to be a level of reward, and I'm sure there is, but even for those that barely got in, um, they're still going to be blessed with just being in the presence of God for eternity. Uh, for not having to... In, the, the worst day in heaven is going to be better than the best day on earth. And, and so... There won't be any such thing as a worse day in heaven. So, 
It says in verse 6, I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. You see, that's a key. We, we need to thirst for the water of life. You remember the woman at the well. He said, I'll give you living water. If you knew who you were speaking to, you'd have a fountain of water living up inside. You wouldn't even have to come back here. You'd have this water. And she wanted that water. We need to desire that type of relationship with God. That type of thirst for his word, for the things of him, for living for him. We need to thirst like that. And if we're thirsty like that, all we have to do is drink. That's all we need to do. Drink of what he gives to us. Quite often we complicate our relationship with the Lord. We make it about what we're doing for him and, and all of the, the things that I've done. Oh, I do Bible study every day. I read 10 chapters. I, you know, I, I have prayed for everyone I know and, and all of these things. So that must qualify me for something. If we think like that, then we've missed the point. We do those things not because we're trying to qualify ourselves. We do those things because we love who Jesus is and we're grateful for what he's done. You see, it's a natural response to the things that God has done for us. My response is, I just want to pour that out in the world. I want to live like I appreciate it. You know, if someone were to give me a million dollars, I would want to show appreciation. You know, I, I, I would want to bless others because I really don't need a million dollars. But if you would like to, my GoFundMe account is, you know what? Not storing up treasure here. I'm storing up treasure in heaven because I know this place is coming to an end. And so I'm not trying to build up and make things better here for me. I want things better for everyone, but it's going to have to be in the future because I can't do that here. I can't make this world a better place. And that's, there's a lot of people teaching that. There's a lot of people teaching we can bring the kingdom to earth and make things perfect right now. And, and we can live in this new environment here in earth. I don't get that out of the word of God. I really don't. You know, uh, I, I, it's not about making things perfect here. You know who else believes that? Islam. They believe that they're going to cause enough anarchy in earth that the 12th imam, their messiah, is going to come and he's going to bring perfection to the earth. But first they have to bring enough anarchy to the earth for him to come to correct it all. You know who he's bringing with him? Jesus. Jesus is going to be his little helper. And he's going to come and help. That's what Islam teaches. And, and so we're not going to, we have nothing in the creation of the New Jerusalem. We have no input. We have no effort, no amount of effort that we put in is going to change what the New Jerusalem is going to look like and how we're going to live there, how we're going to spend our time, and none of it. It's all the work of God. If we could do something for God that would um, pay off our debt, um, that would be ridiculous, first of all, because it's not feasible. We'd need 10,000 lifetimes to do it, but even then, we couldn't. 
because we were tainted with sin in the first place. And so the only acceptable solution to sin is a pure blood sacrifice from a human to intervene on our behalf. And that human is Jesus. That's He became human and he allowed his pure blood, the only blood, sacrificial blood to be shed for us. And so how much work did we have to put into that? None. But we still have to accept that free gift. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. I want to drink from that fountain. We live in a town with a beautiful fountain. Don't go drinking that water. Okay, that's reclaimed. And we're not getting reclaimed water. We're getting the water of life. We're being refreshed and washed and restored in the water that gives us eternal life. Amen. Verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, and that also includes daughters. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So in verse 7, John told us, um, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And that's what he also wrote in 1 John 5.5 5, when he wrote, who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And so it's being a believer in Jesus as the Son of God that allows us to overcome this world. It's not just believing and, oh, I believe intellectually. There are lots of people that believe intellectually in who Jesus is, but they don't believe in their heart who Jesus is because believing in your heart causes your life to change, causes you to live differently. And that's the kind of belief that we need to demonstrate in our lives. It's not that... He who overcomes, well, I'm going to overcome because I'm going to fight to overcome. No, it's overcoming because we listen to the scriptures, we apply them to our lives, and we live what we believe. It changes the way we live. And because we walk that way, people see the way we live and say, that's different. Now, some people say that's different because you're just weird. That's what the problem is. You're, you're weird. Well, you're a Jesus freak. You know? And I wear that as a badge of honor. Yes, I am a Jesus freak. I'm all freaky about Jesus. You know? That's okay. Because it, you don't like that, then that tells me I'm doing the right thing. That tells me I'm living the way I'm supposed to be living. He's our God. We are his children. What greater promise can we have than to be children of God? But those who choose to live cowardly lives, unbelieving all of the things that are mentioned there in verse 8, they have no hope. Their future is the lake of fire and brimstone. That lake wasn't created for humans that were disobedient. That lake was created for Satan and his demons. But because of the fact that people would rather follow and listen to and ignore God and believe in the devil, they're worshiping him without even knowing it, many of them are worshiping this devil. I'm sure that the guy who pulled the trigger yesterday thought that he was doing a good thing. Because, you know, by the world, by what he heard, you know, people say, 
you're brainwashed reading the Bible. Yes, I am. My brain is clean. I washed it in the word of God. You know, he was brainwashed by the world to think what he was doing was a good thing. That he was doing something positive. And, and that didn't come, um, well, it came from the enemy. We know that it was the enemy that whispered in his ear. But that comes from listening to the world rather than listening to God. Trusting in the world rather than trusting in the word. Verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, I, I just want to get, to get this picture out of your mind. He's not walking around with the bowl. Okay, that was done in another chapter. He just happened to be the, the angel that was doing that. So, but now he's there with John, and John recognized him. Oh, you had that bowl. Okay, I remember you. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I really can't wait to find out who number 12 is. That name, you know. Think about it. Okay, so um, this city is called the Bride of Christ, which implies a powerful relationship between the people in it and the city. You can see much of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. When you go up there, you can, you know, see a, a large area across from the Temple Mount. But John is taken up to a higher point, a much higher point, because he sees this whole city. It's a high mountain. He can see the whole thing. The description is really hard to understand as he explains what this thing looks like. The beauty is magnificent. It has 12 gates signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. So those were the Old Testament, the sons of Jacob. These were the sons of Israel, the, the 12 tribes there. And then the 12 foundations or the 12 apostles. And John is, gives us more detail in verse 15 where he says, And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. And the city is laid out as a square, its length, is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. And then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, the measure of an angel. And so here is this picture. How big is this city, 1,500? furlongs uh, uh, well is you know that's a pretty um, large uh, let me see it said it's laid out of a square it's 12,000 fur furlongs 1500 miles miles so if you had the upper west corner of this city it would be north of Seattle the southern corner would be south of San Diego. And that would be the west side of it. The east side of it would be Omaha, Nebraska. And then you have the north and the south, and you can fill in the square. And then it's 
also 1,500 miles high. How's that? I don't know. I'm told. So I'm just going to go with what I'm told. That's what it is. The walls were 144 cubits, which is 218 feet. Big, tall walls all the way around it. Three gates on each side. What an awesome looking um, structure, city, this is going to be. And if there were 100 billion people that were on earth from the time of Adam and Eve until now, and there weren't, but if there were 100 billion people from that time until now, and only 20% of them were saved, each person would get 75 acres in the city. And, um, you know, I, I'm hoping that I don't have to mow <laughs> the yard. 75 acres. At least I'll have all of eternity. So the construction of its wall, this is another thing that I can't grasp. The construction of its wall was of jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophaz, and sounds like something that was in my vitamin this morning, the 11th jacinth, and the 12th amethyst. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And that's amazing. I, I can't even fathom what that would look like can you imagine the size of the oyster to produce a pearl that looked like that? You know, and, um, you know, and, and in my mind, these aren't imitation pearls. These, this is one pearl made this up. The impression that John gives us is that it's so beautiful. It's so awesome. We look at this and we're just like, wow. We're going to be standing there looking at this for a long time to take it all in, to try to grasp what this is. Walking the streets, just looking at everything, and the streets are cold. And it's just going to be amazing. You know why it's so amazing? God is the architect. He's the one that's designed it all. Verse 22, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the uh, glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Every great city in the world has a temple. They're all temples of various gods and so on and so forth, but they've got temples that are supposed to be for their little god. The one true God has been showing up on earth since the Garden of Eden, and he doesn't demand temples. He started it in, in the, this tabernacle meeting with the people. Then, yeah, Solomon built him a temple, and then the other temple was built by Ezra and then Herod expanded on that. But that's nothing compared to what the millennial temple will look like. I think Jesus is going to have this awesome temple during the millennium, during the thousand years. But when the new Jerusalem comes, there's no need for a temple anymore. You don't need... 
we, can, we have God right there. We don't need to go to a temple. We don't need to worship at the temple. The whole city is the temple. It's where God is going to be. And there's no need for the sun or moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is the light. He's the source of light there in the temple. I believe the light's going to come from every direction. You know, when we read in James uh, chapter 1, 17 and 18, it says that um, God is the source of all good gifts. All good and perfect gifts come from God, right? But then it says that, that there is no shadow of turning with God. There are no shadows when it comes to God because he illuminates in such a way that it completely engulfs us and surrounds us. I believe that's how light is going to work in the new Jerusalem. It's just going to be there. It's going to be everywhere. There's not going to be a source for it. It'll just be present with us always. There's not going to be any shadows or anything like that. Shadows implies darkness. And there's not going to be any darkness in that land, in that new world that's coming to us. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there. Bummer. Because when do I take naps? We're going to have to get one of those, you know, the eye things that you wear at night. I, I, we can't fathom this. There's not going to be any night because there's not going to be a reason for night because we don't have to sleep. We're going to be energized by God always. And there's not going to be any reason uh, to sleep. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so there it is. The gates are going to remain open. There is no night. Why would you want to leave anyway? Why would you want to go out through the gate unless going fishing. So there isn't time as we know it because you don't have anything to measure time with. Days and nights, there's no reason for it. The good news is we'll never be late for an appointment. We'll always be on time for everything we do. And I believe that God will have stuff for us to do. We're, we're just not going to be sitting around playing the harp, you know, or anything like that. You know, we're, there's going to be things for us to do. We're, we're going to have... Can you imagine traveling through the universe without the Hubble telescope and just going and seeing the universe? I, I believe we're going to have the ability to do that. I, I believe we're going to have the ability. Now, I'm not told that, but I believe that we're going to be able to do things that we can't even fathom in our mind right now because we're limited by gravity. You know, we're, we're li limited by science. Science limits us to what we know here. All sin will never be able to deliver, uh, to dwell in the city, uh, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is even more reason why we need to ensure our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, that's, I mean, that's an imperative now because we know where they st spend eternity. And so we need to check ourselves and make sure that that's, that's our destination. Our current world will be replaced 
and our new world won't ever experience corruption of any kind. We should be excited about what's coming in the future, but more importantly, we should be excited about who is coming in the future to take us home because that's more important than the actual city we're going to. Let's make sure that we're all prepared when he shows up. Amen?